Well, hey there, how's it going? How is everybody doing? Welcome to Electronic Campfire number eight, I think it is, on this lovely Friday. I hope you are all doing well. Now, I've learned one thing from teaching and teaching around the world, actually, to all kinds of different audiences. The number one thing I've learned is that the audience pays the most attention in the first five minutes of when you go up on stage to teach something. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna mention this right now. I have been playing around with the Sony ZV-1. Okay, it's Sony's vlogging camera. And it has a special wide angle lens attachment onto it. Now, I've used Sony before. I've owned a couple of Sony cameras, but it's been a while. And I have been so immersed in the Fujifilm camera system, the menus, I mean, I, I see the menus now in my sleep, that going back to Sony and trying to figure stuff out in Sony, I will never criticize Fuji's menu system again. This menu system sucks, okay? I mean, it's really confusing. The custom stuff, and I know that I don't know it, and I know I need to get used to it, and no, the channel's not changing to Sony. I'm just playing around with this. I actually am testing a few things on it. So how are you all doing? Let me see who's here. Oh, I love it. We've got some backstage people. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna change this live stream. This is not the Pal Detect live stream. This is the Mr. Jarble show. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jarble. Blue Tech, thank you so much. All of you, I really, really appreciate you being here. Oh my goodness, indiscreetable owl <laughs> in the house. We have Michelle here, Klaus, Shiro. I mean, Chuck, first timer to campfire. Welcome, Chuck, where are you from? Put, let us know in the comments. Natalie, I have not seen you around very much. I, I've, I hope you've been okay. I'm glad you're here. Good to see you. Ah, uh, where are we? Sony was a TV in the 90s. Yeah, Keith. <laughs> yeah, right. This is awesome. This is so awesome. And I would like a little credit, just a little credit. This is the third live stream in a row I've shown up at. I'm here, I'm just saying, okay? So we'll see if we can keep this going, but it's number eight overall, and it's the third in a row that I've attended and, and kept going as far as I can. We now have at least 50 people watching, which is really cool. Hello once again, before I get started, Paul, how you doing, pal? We got Chuck, hi from Orlando. Oh yeah, it's starting to light up, I love this. Okay, if I missed your hello, here's a general hello to everybody. Good to see you. So today, we are talking about aperture, okay? And every camera system does aperture differently. So I will be focusing, obviously, on Fujifilm, and I will be doing a few demos. Some of this material you probably already know. This electronic campfire is more geared, at least the education part, is more geared toward new Fujifilm users. I've had quite a number of comments recently from people who have just picked up an X-T4. So there's quite a new group of Fujifilm users that have joined this channel, so I thought diving into Aperture would be a great idea. So let's do it right now. Once I'm done teaching Aperture and we get all the education stuff out of the way, I will go right back into the comments and, ha and hang out with you. I'll answer some questions. Live stream will be about 45 minutes to an hour today, okay? And if all goes well, I don't see why it wouldn't, I will plan on doing another one of these next week with a different topic. Okay, so let's get into it, all right? Let's get into it. There are four types of Fuji, whoops, gotta put that there. Okay, there are four types of Fujifilm aperture, really, when you get right down to it. The first is clickable. Connected, I call it clickable connected. What does that mean? Okay, well when I say connected, I mean that the lens itself, right, is connected to the camera using these electronic connectors. Okay, so the lens is connected right to the camera and because it's electronic, it's talking to the camera. And because it's talking to the camera, it's sending the aperture information to the camera and you have more control over the aperture, right? So that's the first type of aperture. That's clickable connected. And when I say clickable, I'm talking about, you know, when you rotate the aperture ring, click, 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 clickable. Clickable connected. Everybody hear that? Can you hear it? <laughs> okay, 
Okay, let's go to the next one. The next one is not clickable, but connected. So what would that be? Well, I don't know. Let's see what we can find here. Uh, how about this? No, that's not it. Ah, here we go. This is a Viltrox lens. This is the 56 millimeter, okay? And it's quiet. It's quiet. It doesn't have a clickable aperture. Shh. But, but, it's connected. You see that right there? It's connected. So clickable, and not clickable, connected. And so what it does, can Paldetech put a lens on? There we go. What it does is the lens talks to the camera, except you don't have it, you know, they made the lens so that it's very quiet. It's supposed to be better for video. I personally prefer a clickable aperture 100% of the time over a smooth aperture, but that's personal preference. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Let everybody else. Let's get into a big debate about it. And let's get to the next one. The next one is no aperture ring, but connected. No aperture ring. What would that be? And I wonder why my my sensor is dirty <laughs> right all the time. Okay, what do we have here? What do we have here on the show? We have a Viltrox 85 millimeter. Okay, you see that right there? And the 85 millimeter, if you can, uh, if I can find the little thing to hook it onto the camera. Okay, there it is. Okay. So this particular lens, right, from Viltrox, this was their first third-party Fujifilm lens, was the first Viltrox lens that I ever tested, and it does not have an aperture at all. No ring, nothing, zero. However, it does talk to the camera. It has a little electronic system right here. You can see it, okay? And so it connects to the camera, and so even though the lens itself doesn't have an aperture. I, how long does it take to get it? You know, I'm just going to give up on that. <laughs> okay. Even though the lens itself doesn't actually have an aperture ring, the camera still has more or less the same level of control as the other types of aperture rings that I just told you. So those are the three connected types. Everybody got that so far? How are we doing here? Okay, uh, da, 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 da. all right. <laughs> if anybody's doing the, um, the super chats, hold off on that because I my head is so in teaching. You, you could send me a super chat for an X-H2S camera and I wouldn't even know about it right now. I, it's just the way I am, I get so involved. So I'll see them in a sec, but right now we gotta stay on track, okay? Next, 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 next. All manual, no connected, all right, so. That's pretty easy. Let's use this one. This is a great little lens. This is the TD Artisan. And if you notice, okay, if you can see it right here, okay, look at that. Beautiful, shiny, ooh. But what's it missing? What does it not have? It doesn't have the electronics so that it talks to the camera. So when you are turning the aperture ring on this thing, and you're actually turning it, all you're doing when you're doing this on this type of an aperture, all you're doing is you're just opening up or closing down the aperture. The camera has no idea, really. It, and so, yes, you can see the amount of light coming in through the viewfinder, but the camera's not, it doesn't know what aperture you're at. The camera doesn't, for example, can't go into automatic mode and go, oh, this person, this photographer, this amazing photographer, pal the tech, just set it to F8. Therefore, I'll need to reduce my ISO. Camera can't do that. It has no idea what you're doing. It's just an appendage on the camera. That's all it is. And so that, it, it still works as an aperture ring, but it's not connected at all. And so you can't use the command dials. You can't do anything game over. You know, do not collect $200 and pass go with that. So those are the four types of Fujifilm aperture, okay? Now, when you don't have an aperture ring, like on the Viltrox, obviously you don't have an aperture ring. You're not going to be turning anything. So what do you do? Well, you have to use the camera's command dial, okay? This, I do have to get this lens on. There we go. 
Okay, so let me see if I can get a demo on here. So what you do, you put on the lens that doesn't have the aperture ring, okay? And the first thing you do, you turn it on. Do we have power? Yes, we do. Okay, so you want to, da -da, am I here? Hi. Okay, so what you wanna do is you wanna go into, and it's weird, with aperture, you always go to the same place, and that's button dial setting. Go into button dial setting, and you're looking for something called auto plus manual. Let's see here. Where was it? Did I miss it? Hold on. I think I might have missed it. Standby, technical difficulties. I think it actually may be in camera. Hold on a second. <laughs> Button dial. Command dial setting, okay. That's not it. Here it is. Aperture ring setting, you see that? I do have an excuse for, for taking a little bit of time on this. I have been staring at Sony screens on the ZV-1 for the past three and a half hours. Just saying. Okay, back to the show. Now, all right, aperture ring setting, here it is in auto, okay? Now, you've got auto and you have command. What you wanna do, all right, is you wanna put it into auto. Okay, put it into auto. And then what I like to do is go into aperture setting and put it into auto manual. You see that right there? So this is kind of how I would have it. Except, in some cases, you may find with, a, with an aperture list ring, you should put it into command. So actually, to be perfectly safe, right? if you're writing this down, okay, if you're, if you're being good students and taking notes, what you wanna do is put aperture ring setting A into command, and you wanna put aperture setting into auto plus manual okay and with that that's best because if you do that all right now let me see if I can show you now let me get something to take a picture of okay so now if I am here we'll go here all right whoop okay if I'm rotating the front command dial see how I'm rotating okay can you see, I'm gonna rotate the front command dial. So in all of the next few screen examples, what I'm doing, I'm taking my finger and I'm rotating the front command dial right here. Okay, it's, it's this dial right here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. All right, I'm gonna rotate the front command dial. Whoops, let me get it in focus. Okay, and you look at how aperture is changing. See that, F2.8. F3.2 and on 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 and uh oh we're getting to the end what happens next automatic you see that it's automatic so by putting it into auto plus manual you get the best of both worlds if for example I just went in and I went into button dial setting and I instead put it into, say, manual, okay, manual. Now, if I go to do the same thing, turning the dial, turning the dial, turning the dial, turning the dial, turning, oh, it's stuck, I can't go any further. Let me try it the other way. Turning the dial, turning the dial, turning the dial, oh, it's stuck, it won't go any further. It's impossible to put it in automatic aperture. That's all that means. Does everybody get that? Okay, and the final one, right? The final one, if I go into auto, okay, auto, now you're really screwed, because I don't think it does anything. Let me, let's try it out, auto. Okay, so in auto, I'm turning the command dial. Here we go, turning, turning, turning. Nope, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening because it's perpetually on auto. If you put it on auto in this setting, okay, you won't have the ability whatsoever to control the aperture on a lens that doesn't have an aperture ring. And this really screws up a lot of people. That's why I'm making a big deal about this, okay? So just to be sure, if you just joined the stream or if you're completely lost, 
no worries. I'm going to tell you exactly what you should set it to all the time and never take it out of this setting. And that is go into here, go into here, go into button dial setting, go down into aperture setting and always just leave it in auto plus manual. Boom. Just like that. Okay. That's, this is the most confusing part of the entire campfire today. <laughs> what I just told you. All right. Are we, are we still here? Anybody still on the stream? Oh, great. 135 people. Good. I hope 134 of you aren't confused. So where are we at? Auto manuals best. Got that. Okay. So those are the four types of Fujifilm aperture. Clickable connected, not clickable connected, no aperture ring connected, and all manual but not connected, okay? Any questions on this? Boom, let's see here. All right, let's see, bum, 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 bum. Greetings from Mexico, hello, Mexico. Good to see you. Hi from Germany, hello, Germany. Um, okay, so next thing, is for the real beginners. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because some of you may fall asleep on this one, okay? <laughs> right? But I have to say it because listen, and you gotta be patient. There are a number of people that have been shooting knee high with a cell phone for the past 10 years. And then they decide they want to pick up one of these. And they, they know what aperture is and they've heard of the exposure triangle, but they're really afraid, I see, sometimes to ask these type of questions online in forums because they, I see them get pounced on. Have you noticed that? Have, I mean, there's kind of a, I wouldn't say toxic community with that, but with the very, very beginners asking these kind of questions, what I see a lot is, you know, use Google. And yeah, they could use Google, sure. But I'm just gonna just repeat one thing right now. So if there's anybody who's watching this video, maybe a year from now, and you wanna know just what aperture is, I'm gonna tell you in two seconds, okay? Here it is. All right, aperture points to remember. The smaller the number, the larger the hole, <laughs> okay? That's pretty basic. So when you have a lens, right, and you're turning the ring <laughs> just like this, okay? The smaller the number, wait a minute, am I turning it right, right way? Okay, the smaller the number, the larger the hole is gonna be. Let's see if we can see it in here. Hold on a second. I can show it to you. Yeah, I can. All right, let's see if I'm gonna have to stand up to do this. Okay, so have a look at this. Okay, here we go. See that? Look at that. Just like your eye, okay? Just like the iris in your eye. Just like that. And so the smaller the number, the larger the hole. And likewise, the larger the hole, right the 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 larger the hole the less it's in focus that is a big deal the larger the hole the less it's in focus and i know all of you photographers know this about depth of field but it bears repeating that aperture is one of the most important elements of photography because you can control where you are diverting the attention of the viewer of your photograph okay if you are gonna do like a Citizen Kane type of cinematography and you're gonna have deep focus and you're gonna have everything in focus in the foreground and everything in focus in the background, where's the attention go? I don't know. If you're gonna shoot that way and you're gonna be using small little aperture holes, you better use really good composition for your scene so as not to overwhelm them, right? For example, the background right here, if I didn't, you know, if I had it crystal clear, you would see like things growing out of my head. You would see these poles, you would see things like that. It would look weird. But as you make the aperture hole larger, right, you can then reduce the depth of field. You reduce the amount that in your image that's in focus, okay? So let me just show you what I mean by that. Um, let's try it with this lens right here. This is a 35 millimeter F2. I love this lens. I don't know if any of you have it, but this is one of my favorites. And I'm just gonna put it on. And this lens has uh, an aperture uh, range of two all the way through 16 and automatic, okay? And, you know, generally, once you kind of nail down your exposure and you're thinking about how you're gonna compose your shot, one of the big questions you need to ask yourself is, what do you want 
to be in focus in your picture, right? So let's just do a quick example, all right? In this shot right here, I am shooting Thanos, all right? And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put it on F16. There it is. And if you look at that, that's really busy, and that's making Thanos mad, bad, and sad. Thanos is not happy right now because there's too much junk going on in the background. There's a plant, there's my studio back. Look, there's a pole growing out of his head. You see that? Look at that. So what I'm going to do, beginning photographers, is I am going to rotate the aperture ring, right? And I'm gonna rotate it, and I'm gonna make it a smaller number with a larger hole, which is gonna give less of the image in focus, okay? So here we go. We're at F, uh, let me go back to F16. Okay, here's F16, and Thanos is right here. I'm focusing in on Thanos. I'm turning it, here we go. Watch the background, watch the background as we go down to F2. Look at that. There's still stuff in the background, okay? But look at how much better Thanos looks. Okay, this shot right here versus this shot right here. Do you see that? I know everybody understands that, but I gotta ask, because we do have some beginners. Does everybody understand this? Okay. <laughs> and yes, Norman is correct. IBIS has nothing to do with aperture whatsoever. If anybody in this chat is asking about IBIS, I just did a video on IBIS. Go see that video. It'll tell you all about IBIS. Okay? All right. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jarble asks, what lens do I use for my A cam on my live stream? For years, I used the Fuji, Fujifilm 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens that came with Fujifilm. And I am now using the Sigma art lens. Um, and I, my mind is blanked out on, it's the, the I'll, I'll have to look at it. It's buried in the thing over there, but it's the Sigma art lens that I had for with a Canon. It's for Canon and I have an adapter on that. And I just like it. I like the look of it a lot. So um, I'll have to get the specs for you. I can't see it right now. Um, and I honestly don't remember. I just changed it over. <laughs> I wasn't even really paying attention to what I, to, to like the, you know, the focal length. I was just looking at visually what it looked like. And um, I love it. I, I love this lens. I think this is going to be a keeper. And the autofocus is pretty good for a non-native Fuji lens. Um, but I use all Fuji equipment for the most part for everything I shoot on this channel. Okay. So where are we now? All right. So we did that. Da -da 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 -da. All right. So automatic versus fixed aperture. You know, obviously, if you want your camera to be more automatic, you can throw your aperture into A. And then now the camera is making the decision for that. How many of you shoot that way, where you just let the camera decide your aperture? Because I don't know about you, for me, if I was picking up a Fuji camera and I was wondering about exposure triangle and what's the best thing to prioritize. I would say, if you're gonna give a task to the camera, give it ISO. Put ISO in automatic. Take control of aperture as much as you can. And I tell people, you know, when you're shooting video, for example, start off by putting it at f4 and go from there. Put the lens at f4 and then make everything else around it. Because f2, if you're just starting out in video, might be a little too, little too much depth of field. But f4 is not a bad place to be on a lens, especially the 18 to 55. So what about you guys? Do you do aperture all the time or do you ever put it in automatic and let the camera deal with it? Let me know, let me know. Aperture priority, yeah, see. I never use auto, okay, fully manual, right. Okay, so remember that there is a group of people out there that we want them to feel welcome, we want them to feel like the Fuji fam is the best, and it is, but they may have questions like that. You know, what do I do? do I, is it good to let the camera do it? I, I don't think so. I think it's better to be in control of the aperture. The only thing I actually think is more important than that is to be in control of your shutter speed. And that's just simply because I don't want a blurry shot if I don't intend it to be. So in the order of importance, shutter speed, aperture, 
ISO, I think. In terms of importance, I'm speaking really generally here, but obviously if you're in a studio and you have complete control and the camera's locked down on a tripod, you know, you can have auto shutter speed in a lot of cases. But yeah, so, okay. The other thing that can, that can uh, help you is to assign a custom button to show you what your depth of field is gonna look like as a preview so that you can see it before you take the shot. So you're not having to kind of be out there going like that, but rather you just hit a button and it shows you. The other reason you would wanna use a custom button to show you your depth of field is because of there's a little gotcha with Fuji. And that is if you have your aperture ring, let's say, or let's say you've got your ISO set to A for automatic, you've got your shutter speed set to A for automatic, and then you're trying to see your depth of field by half pressing down the shutter button and turning the aperture, it won't show you the depth of field. It will only show you the depth of field if you've got two or more out of three of these, right, in fixed values. So if you've got two of them as automatic and aperture not, you're not gonna see your depth of field. So th there's a way around that. Let me, let me show you this whole thing. So let's, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna assign the Q button right here. This is going to become my depth of field preview button, okay? Depth of field preview button. And the way you do that, uh, first of all, DISP back, okay? So you press and you hold this down for five seconds. One, two, three, oh, three seconds, okay? Three seconds. Okay, so now that I'm holding that down, let's, uh, let's get into it. So we're gonna go down here, da -doom, da -doom, da -doom, until we get to the Q button. There's the Q button, okay? And we are going to assign it depth of field, if I can find it. <laughs> Dude, it's gonna be on the last page. Of course, but of course. <sighs> Preview depth of field, you see that? You see that? Okay, so there, boom. You see how I've just assigned it? Okay, so now I'm gonna aim the camera at Thanos again. Let me move Thanos back. All right, I'm gonna aim the camera at Thanos. Okay, and can you see it? Yes, you can. Okay, I'm aiming the camera at Thanos. I am now taking my finger and I am pressing the Q button. Okay, nothing really happened. Let me try six, F16. Okay, hold on. Okay. I'm gonna t okay, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change it from F16 to F2.0. I am now, in fact, you know what, let's do this. I'm gonna focus first. I think that's what's confusing. I am gonna focus on Thanos. Okay, there. Now, go back here. Let's get our settings to display. Okay, whoops. All right, so. Okay, just so we can see. We are at F2 right now. I am gonna rotate the aperture ring until I get to F16, and now I'm gonna press the Q button. Look at that, see that? Something very important to remember, the Q button is not you press and hold it down. It's a toggle switch. So you press it once, and now you're previewing your depth of field. Then you press it again to get out of that. Does that make sense? So something to know about that, okay? Okay, got aperture on the brain. If you're having trouble with figuring out, let's say you don't want to use the aperture ring, okay? You don't want to lift your arm up and do this. You would rather use your thumb and just adjust aperture like this, or your finger. You want to assign it to the command dial. How do you do that? It's very, very, very easy, okay? So what you want to do is you go into button dial setting, Command dial setting. You see how it's highlighted the front command dial for f-stop. Change, you go ahead and you can change that. Oh, it's on aperture already. Oh, it didn't really show, it just says f. But if, for example, it was on shutter speed, 
it, like if it looked like this, if you see it look like this, you're not gonna be able to control your aperture using the front command dial. If you happen to see it and change it this way to aperture, now you can control the aperture using the front command dial, okay? For those of you that need to do that. Hope it makes sense, okay. All right, I'm, I'm apertured out <laughs> right now, so let's do some Q&As, okay? And please, if you have any aperture-related questions, let me know. Um, you know, I would love to answer all questions, but I probably can't, and a lot of questions I may not be able to answer if they're things like, you know, what's better, the blah, 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 or the blah, blah, blah. I don't know, just depends, but ask away. I'll see what I can do with this, okay? Uh, Let's see, I'm gonna go back here. Ooh, we got uh, a lot of people shooting in manual only. I'm very impressed. But you know what? I am more impressed with someone that's, that is like, you know what? It's okay sometimes to let the camera take control because I'm in a situation that I know if I give the camera control, the camera's gonna be confined to a place where yeah, the camera can take control, right? But not too much control. Just enough control that I don't have to think about this mundane thing that the camera's gonna do, and I can instead focus on composition. The best way to think about shooting with automatic is think about freedom, right? Giving the camera control, freedom, is feeling easy in the harness, okay, <laughs> right? So in other words, the camera, you don't wanna give it too much control. Narrow the control, maybe give it ISO control within a limited range. And now you can be free to focus on other things. Or just shoot manual and then, you know, you are absolutely in control of everything. But I think for people just starting out, you don't necessarily need to jump into manual. Try putting the camera in all automatic for everything. I would rather you focus on understanding the film simulations and what you can get from that and how to shoot that way and understanding how to set white balance if you're a JPEG shooter. Those are far more important concepts to learn, I think, right out of the gate with a brand new Fuji cam. Okay. Uh, thank you for the super, Mr. Jarble. <laughs> I don't have a lemon character or baby lemon, but that is that is an awesome image. I, I've got to find one and make it an animated graphic. I am, believe it or not, I am so inept at this live stream stuff because my experience in teaching comes from being in front of an audience live. So I sometimes, and when I would do it live, I would often trip over the mic cord or I would knock the, the projector up, like move it, knock it from the screen because I get so focused on what I'm saying that I literally, it's like a tunnel. I, it's like a tunnel. I don't see anything going on, anything at all. There is a really cool video and, and I want you to apply this to your photography. There is a really cool video out there. I want you to, when you're done with today's live stream and you're on YouTube, I want you to YouTube or Google gorilla playing basketball test. Gorilla playing basketball test. And what they did, okay, was it was a basketball game. They set a camera up and they had these people playing basketball. They had two teams. One was wearing, I guess, white shirts. The other team was wearing black shirts. And they were there. They were told just pass the basketball back and forth, okay? But make sure you the minute you get the basketball, you throw it to the other person. And so it was just a bunch of basketball being thrown back and forth. And they were so focused on that. And while they were doing that, the people who were conducting the, the experiment, the test, they dressed somebody up in a gorilla costume, and they had this gorilla. I swear to God, it's on there. He had this gorilla walk out into the middle of, literally the middle of where they're throwing the basketball, stand in the middle in a complete gorilla outfit, turn, face the camera, and do this kind of, you know, beating the chest thing, you know, and then turn and walk off. And not a single person noticed it. N nobody noticed it at all. It is the coolest experiment. But that's what you gotta get into when you're shooting. And so it's okay, especially when you're starting out, 
If you have to think too much, go ahead and put the camera, put some of the functions in automatic. It's more important that you focus on the story. Okay. This is the part where I would say, uh, any questions? All right, Ibis. Um, okay, we have a question about Ibis. Um, when I pan using Ibis, it jumps, how can you fix it? That depends on the lens and it depends on an IBIS setting. Let me show you real quick. So the IBIS setting that it depends on that causes a lot of that jumping is this one. Oh, hold on, I gotta put it in movie mode. Okay, it's this setting right here. IS mode boost, okay? If you have that turned on, you're gonna see jumping. A lot more, a lot more. And here, you're gonna see a lot more jumping if you have DIS. So try just putting it here and have it set exactly as I am showing it to you, just like that, okay? It's not gonna solve all of the jumping because there is inherently jumping depending upon the lens. Some lenses do it more than others, but that's the only way I know of to help reduce it. Okay, let's see. Bup, 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 bup. What lenses would I recommend for beginners? I want some of you to help me with this question because it's so subjective in some ways, but honestly, the 18 to 55 or the 16 to 80, one of those, probably the 18 to 55, because it's not as big or expensive as the 16 to 55. It gives you a lot of choice. Do I have one around here? No, it's on the, on the other camera. Um, and if you're a beginner, you should be able to go really far with that lens. And if you can't, and you're the sort of photographer or person that says, no, I need to have a prime and I need to have a blah, 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 then no, you're, gonna, you're doomed out of the gate. You should be able to make a lot work with that lens. So that's the lens I, I would recommend. Uh, okay, thank you, Burke. Uh, what is the best app? Let's see, hold on. I should, I'm, I know I'm missing people and I feel so bad. Uh, this is scrolling all the way down to China. Uh, a lot of people don't use that, okay. Good part, good 30 part. Okay, here's a, here's a good one. What are good third party lenses for the X-T4? Let me show you one of my favorites, okay. <clears throat> this little guy right here. Viltrox 13 millimeter F1.4. This is, I think, one of, if not the best third-party lens for Fujifilm. In terms of performance, in terms of build quality, in terms of everything else. However, you know, I mean, it's 13 millimeters. So you have to ask yourself, you know, is that the focal length that you want? Viltrox generally makes very good lenses for Fuji. So I would have a look over to their site, have a look. I also have reviews on all, almost all their lenses, I think. So Viltrox is definitely what I would recommend if you're looking for third-party lenses. I also really, 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 really happen to love if you're into macro and you don't want to spend the money on the Fuji macro, which, you know, it's expensive. It's incredible, but it's expensive. Um, this one right here. This is the, can we focus, 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 there we go. TD Artisan, okay, 40 millimeter macro. Uh, and I happen to love, love this lens. So um, check those out. If you're into macro, that's a good one to consider, third party, excellent lens. If you're looking for overall good quality, you, you can't go wrong with Viltrox in terms of, you know, their primes. Um, and I am going to be soon reviewing Tamron. Um, in fact, I've got the lens somewhere around here. I think it's over there. Hold on, the 17 to, <laughs> I can't see it from here, hold on. <laughs> the 17 to 70, I think it is. Yeah, um, I'm gonna be reviewing that. So if you're thinking about a zoom lens, hold off because I've heard really good things about that and I'd like to review it, and it's on the production schedule for the next couple of weeks. So that, that review is coming, the Tamron, as well, so. Okay, where are we, let me get back here. Yeah, Natalie, it is awesome, isn't it? Awesome. Yes, Tamron is good for bird photography, absolutely, and of course the Fuji lenses, you know, are, are great. Um, a Nifty 50, cheap 50, let's see, okay. 
Uh, 18 to 35. You know, Ken, I have also heard from, I don't have that lens, but I've heard from a lot of people that that is actually the least talked about but most loved lens. So I, <laughs> I, I've never used it. I don't know. But uh, definitely. And Norman is right. You know, the 18 to 120 should be interesting as well. Um, Marco, I would love to go to Italy. I love, oh. I would love to go to Italy. Yeah, I, one day I will. I will let you know if I go there because that Italy is awesome. I've been all over the place and, and absolutely love it. Um, okay, so what else do we have? Nature photography. We got the sep oh the Seven Artisans Macro 60 millimeter f 2.8. Okay, I have not tested that one either. Um, you know, so many lenses to test and so little time to do it. <laughs> Right, And to be honest with you, I'm not a huge lens testing video lover of making those kinds of videos. They're, they're okay. I mean, I enjoy them. I try to make them fun, but there are other types of videos I prefer making than, than just lens reviews. And it's just not my thing. There are great lens review YouTubers out there, and I am just not one of them. Um, I'm more practical with it, and, and I don't get into the whole all the optics is, I probably should get more into that, but it's just not something that is as important to me as other, I, I like teaching the concepts of the camera and, and trying to explain stuff like ISO and things like that. I think that's where I, I seem to do better with that sort of material, yeah. Uh, Hey, we got the best resource on the planet. Fuji Rumors in the house. Now I'm honored. I need a, um, do I have like a, I need a, that thing's horrible. I need some kind of like, you know, yay thing. And, and there's a way to do it in the streaming software. You press a button and a bunch of balloons come up and fireworks. I, again, I don't know how to, to work any of this yet. And I've, I just haven't had the time, but Welcome, great to see you. I am so excited for September 8th. We've got another Fuji Summit. This time it's in New York City. I will be doing a video on this. I believe they're announcing the X-H2 camera and possibly some other things. So stay tuned. We got some big stuff coming up with Fuji and it's gonna be in New York, which is awesome. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Great to see you here, awesome. Uh, let's see here. I am not, okay, I need some astrophotography experts to weigh in on this question, please, because I am, I'll be the first to admit, not an astrophotographer. And I would, don't want to give out advice unless I'm sure of it. So anybody can jump in there if you shoot the stars, uh, let, let them know. Um, will I be going? Possibly, possibly. That's all I'm gonna say. Possibly, yeah. Um, we'll see. Depends on a lot of things, actually. <laughs> Gasoline, groceries, <laughs> you know, the stuff that seems to be 10 times more expensive lately. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll put it to you this way. If I'm not there, I'm gonna be watching it live and I'm gonna be doing a video on it. So uh, we'll see, I may be, I don't know. We'll see, it's, it's still, still thinking about it. Um, Best telephoto lens is Fuji, well, oh, all right. If you do this again, Mr. Jarble, I'm just gonna change the, pan the channel name to Mr. Jarble's show because <laughs> it's like, thank you, man. You don't need to do that. Thank you so much. That is so kind of you. And that does g help out the channel. In fact, backstage members, and there are a number of you, listen up, backstage members, let me tell you where your money's going, okay? I have been coordinating with a company today using, and, and you have to pay them, okay? So part of the money from backstage, this is where your money is going. I am taking some of that money from backstage, your generous contributions, and what I am working on doing is getting all future videos and some of the really important ones that I've done already, like on ISO and things like that, I'm getting them translated and dubbed into Spanish, Italian, German. I want them to be in other languages for people. Captioning is great, and I pay for that on every single video, but I also have had a lot of Spanish speakers. I have a big Spanish speaking audience and they are really wanting accessibility for these videos. And, and I'm a firm believer that 
every video. You, there should not be a YouTube channel ever anywhere that doesn't capture their own videos because even if someone's not hard of hearing and even if they can hear loud and clearly, so many people turn down the volume anyway and just watch the video without the sound. And so having good captions is, is really important. And I do captions in two ways. I have a service that I pay called Rev, R-E-V, which is, they're, they're okay. I mean, they get, they get the job done and they're, they're fairly inexpensive. But I also caption my own stuff. And what's really funny about that is I do a coffee time for backstage. I have a coffee time. And I have a member who has requested captioning for those coffee time videos. They're about eight minutes long, these videos. And it's basically me in the studio, coffee with my backstage group, and I grumble about what's going on with the channel, <laughs> right? I mean, anybody who watches coffee time, you can jump in here and, and confirm. I'm either griping about something, grumbling about something, or telling you what I'm doing. So. Those videos I caption by myself. And let me tell you something, it's a pain in the butt, okay? Because when I do it, like when I say, well, today I wanted to buy an XH2S, the, the software tries to understand what I'm saying. It doesn't know what Fujifilm means, pal to tech, forget about it. It doesn't spell it right. XH2S, ISO, F, F5.7. I mean, I have a lot of weird technical terms in this channel. And so what I have to do is when I shoot coffee time on every Monday morning, I do a coffee time. When I shoot it, I got to sit down and caption it. And I've noticed that it takes me longer to caption the video than it does to write it and shoot it and edit it. So captioning's big. It's important and it's time consuming, but I just can't possibly do it myself. So the, the backstage members and the contributions that you've been making, I'm working on getting a service to help me out with that, starting with the Spanish speakers. Okay. <sighs> All right. So uh, where are we back? 12 millimeter F2 Samyang, there we go. Astrophotography, we got some good advice here. Okay, all hyped up on coffee too, that's right. I am hyped up on coffee. And that's, you know, and, and that's my one cup of coffee, but it's a prop. And so I'm, I'm really drinking coffee at coffee time, but I can't drink the coffee until I roll the camera. I don't wanna drink half of it and then open up, hi, welcome to coffee time, and it's half full. That bothers me. So I have it full. I have it full with foam and I put some cinnamon on it, right? I mean, I make it look good and it's in the intro. But I'll, I gotta tell you, there are some coffee time mornings where I have this cup of coffee sitting there and then the stupid Mac, the mouse will disconnect or an SSD will disconnect or there'll be another or a battery will die and I have to stop what I'm doing and I gotta go fix and fix it. And then by the time I get back, the coffee's cold. I gotta drink it anyway, it's a prop. So the coffee's not always great, but it definitely is consumed on every single episode for sure. Um, okay. Shutter speed, not slutter. Okay. All right. Okay. Can you do an ND filter demo budget options? Yes. Yes, I can. I can't do it on this show tonight, but yes, I can do that. In fact, um, I'm noticing, yeah, a lot of cameras like the CV1 have built in ND filter. You just flip a switch. Boy, I wish Fuji had that. I really do. That would help so much but they don't. So yeah, and I have a number of ND filters and I can go over the ones I like, some tips on how to use them, how I recommend aligning them up with video, and sure, it's a great idea. It's a really good idea. Okay, we got another one here, the Rokinon. I would say look at Rokinon lenses for astrophotography. That seems to be what a number of people are saying here um, as the way to go. So, okay. We are good here. You never want to use, but yeah, that's absolutely right. Norman is correct. With regard to ND filters, I will say, don't rush out and get a budget one. If you have a, you know, $600 piece of glass and you put a cheap $20 filter over it, not good. That's just not good, okay? That's like putting lipstick on a pig. You don't want to do that. So you do need to invest with ND filters. I will tell you right now, you're looking at about $100 for a decent one. Um, but if you get one really good one, assuming you take care of it, it, it'll last you. And the biggest thing about ND filters to remember is color shifting. And you want to make sure that you get an ND filter that doesn't cause too much color shifting, because that can be an issue. And obviously, 
it's variable ND filters are a whole different beast. And I'm getting a little into the weeds with this, but there is a lot to know with it. But just to tell you right now, if you're like hovering over B&H Photo right now, hold off on the budget stuff. Ask around. If anybody has any um, ideas on ND filters that we can throw out, just a brand or two that he can go check now, let me know and I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, glass, not resin. Very, very good point, Norman. Absolutely. That's right. Um, hockey photography. He needs an ND filter for shooting. Oh, so you you probably need a polarizing filter, but... Um, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So yeah, see if you guys can, can let him know that. Um, and it's funny because as I read the comments and as the more I connect with you, especially through backstage and discord, we have the discord server and I'm, and I'm noticing this, it's humbling because I'm learning more than I think I'm teaching. You know, it's one thing to go and teach, you know, to, to turn on the camera and to roll it and to say, well, today we're going to compare the ZV-1 with the Fujifilm X-T4 and we're going to go outside and, you know, that, you know, and I do that and I live in that world. But then I see what you all do as you start to interact with each other and respond to each other and the help that you provide with each other. And I am just, you know, I'm humbled. And that doesn't even count when I see your photos. Right. When I see your photos, I've seen some photos on Discord that people put up and, and elsewhere. I want to shut the channel down. I feel like a big imposter. I feel like, wh who the hell am I? Who the hell am I to be telling this group anything? You know, but it, it's it's incredibly humbling. And so what I've that bothered me for a while. And it bothered me around the 70, 80, 90,000 subscriber range. Then when I hit 100, it was like, you know, a kick in the head of like, well, I mean, <laughs> I can't be doing everything bad. I did get 100, so I'm doing something right with this. And then I've kind of gotten to a place where it's maybe, maybe my contribution isn't giving all the knowledge as much as it's somehow connecting people themselves together to give each other the knowledge. Maybe that's a bigger part of the whole. It's the community aspect. That's the next level, right? You know, when you start your journey in YouTube, when you start your journey in YouTube, I think you you start out as it's just you in a room and you're just sharing kind of what you know. But as you do become more popular, you then draw a community and then that community connects. And that's the part I'm the most excited about to be honest with you. I think this Fujifilm community is the best in the world. Uh, there is a reason I love Fujifilm, and it's not always about the camera menus, okay, or the settings. I can get frustrated with sometimes with Fuji. No, it's the community. The community is incredible. Fujifilm, if you're watching this video, you really need, this is your wake-up call, okay? You get a chance once in a lifetime. You've got the best camera photographer and videographer community on the planet that you are making these things for and and you need to embrace that you know do whatever you got to do to embrace that okay off soapbox okay um do -do 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 -do. all righty oh here we go natalie's got a, a there we go gobi filters good all right good 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 okay excellent and Tony Whitfield, thank you. Thank you so much. You are welcome and I really appreciate the support. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Whoops, Thanos fell. Um, <laughs> all the toys. Okay, so we do have to wrap it up. If there's any other questions that you have for me, let me know now before I sign off. I'm gonna try and do this next week. Um, you know, how are we doing on the health on the... We're doing pretty good. We got 145 people. So, and I'm looking at the stats. We've had 846 views and 145 concurrent people watching at the same time. You know, people drop in and then they hear me mention the Sony ZV-1. They go, oh, the hell with him. And they turn it off. So it's not people who are watching all the time. Um, but it's not a bad stream today at all, I think, right now. It's, it's not. Um, okay. Dimitri, you have one in Super Chat. All right, let me see if I can find those Super Chats. Uh, I really wish I could be better at this. 
We got Mr. Jarbel. Okay, Dimitri, I did not, I don't see it here, but thank you. Do you have a question? Shoot it in here if you can. I've got this ordered by most recent, so um, for some reason I didn't see it and I am sorry. Those of you who did do a super chat and I did not mention you or address your question, as I say on every live stream, I have software called Ecamm Live. And what it does is when I click finish on here, it saves everything to a text file. All of your comments are saved dig, 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 to a text file. And I read those. And so I will see your questions. And those of you I, I will reach out to, you know, if it's something that I can help you with, um, or if, if it's a question you've asked in Super Chat and I didn't get to, I apologize, but I will, I will hit you up there on it. Um, I will go to your YouTube channel. Hopefully you'll have an email there um, and, or a link to your Instagram and I can contact you through there. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah. Okay, so, all uh, right. I think we are just about done. Let's see, indoor video. I have my shutter speed set to two times the frame rate. Shutter speed, wait a minute, indoor video. Shutter speed twice the frame rate. Is it a good idea to lock aperture on lowest setting to lend in as much light as possible? Uh, hold on, I gotta put this here. Shutter speed is twice the frame rate. Okay, that's correct, good. That's what you want, okay? Is it a good idea to lock aperture on lowest setting to let in as, see I can't operate this thing. Lowest setting to let in as much light as possible and then play with ISO. No, not necessarily. Because remember that when you put your aperture in, when you say the lowest setting, you mean the widest aperture, right? Like F2. Um, if you do that, you're gonna have very little in focus. You're gonna have very shallow depth of field. You may not want that with what you're shooting that's going to affect your scene. So my answer to you is worry about your scene first, okay? You've set your shutter speed to be double your frame rate. Ching, good job. Next item on the list, okay? Next item on the list, aperture. So now you look through your viewfinder and you're aiming your camera and you're setting up your scene. You have your subject, maybe you've got something in the background, maybe there's a, a plane taking off, but you, you wanna have it so that you can see that plane. You don't want it to be so blurry that it's only about the subject in the foreground. So the first thing, the second thing you do after you've done your shutter speed is you adjust your aperture so that maybe you put it to F5.6, for example. You're not worrying about light right now. You're worrying about composition. Once you've done that, then you can monkey with your ISO dial. Then you can do that. That's the way I would approach it. Um, anyone else have a different opinion, let them know, but that is how I would do it. Um, because ISO will give you some latitude. Now, obviously, you may be in a dark situation shooting a concert where you've got your shutter speed real high because you want to you know, capture the moment, but you, you have to put your aperture to F2 wide open because otherwise your ISO is gonna be 12,800. It's gonna be too grainy. So there, it plays off each other. So because it plays off each other, worry about your aperture first. And enough light is also subjective because you may want your scene to be on the dark moody side and not brightly lit up, especially if you're shooting video. What you don't wanna do, what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna put the camera in all automatic with video and then follow the subject in different lighting situations because what's gonna happen is the camera is gonna constantly be adjusting to the changing light and it's gonna be very strange. It's gonna, you don't see that in film, you don't see that in shows and things like that. So you wanna set it to a constant and make sure the lighting is correct for the scene that you're trying to shoot. Same thing with white balance. Don't ever set your camera to automatic white balance if you're shooting anything that you wanna have some consistency from, from shot to shot, okay? Now, if you're vlogging, you know, you know, you know, hi guys, and you're going from one room into another. So if I go from this studio, which is a cooler color temperature, into the Aux studio to get myself my seventh cup of coffee for the day, as I walk in there, the lighting is warmer. And if I have this camera set to auto white balance, it's gonna change as I'm walking in there, okay? Which is fine. The problem is when I go to edit, if I'm applying color correction from the footage in here, as I'm walking into the next room, that all gets screwed up, right? Does that make sense? Because I've applied it to what 
this scene is, but now I'm walking into the other room. It's a different way of thinking from shooting stills, which is you freeze the moment and then you work on it later, to shooting video, which is you are capturing multiple moments, multiple pictures at once that flow together and the white balance is gonna cause that flow. To, I'm just gonna keep going back and forth like this <laughs> the rest of the stream. But I hope that makes sense. Um, really important. You're seen first. Always you're seen first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that was probably a longer answer than you wanted. <laughs> okay, we got a good advice here. Don't buy gear based on gearheads advice. Follow photographers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, absolutely. I mean, you know. Um, oh, okay, here we go. Any advice for new YouTubers? Yeah, I do, actually. Um... I have a number of friends who are YouTubers that I think are very talented. I'm not going to mention any names. I think Natalie might know who I'm talking about here, but I'm not going to mention any names. And they talk all the time about the subject of creativity. And they are incredible. They are really talented. They're incredibly talented. They're incredibly talented YouTubers. And the problem is that they don't show up for work every day and put out videos, right? It's a lot of theory, it's a lot of talk, it's a lot of waiting for the right moment. It's like that, you know, that actor from New York who's doing stage and theater and very serious, goes out to Hollywood, walks onto a set, the director says, okay, let's go, time is money. And the actor goes, well, wait a minute, oh, hold on. I need, I need to prepare, I need to prepare and get into the character, I need 25 minutes to prepare. No, who gives a crap, just get, just get it going. So my advice for YouTubers would be, Show up to work every day, put out videos. As Mr. Beast said, you know, do a hundred videos. You need to do a hundred videos minimum because your hundredth video will be so much better than your third video. And that would be number one piece of advice is just do a hundred videos and, and do things that you're interested in. But more importantly, do things that you are finding out through your analytics that your audience is interested in. Same with photography, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the same with any kind of art. Um, and I have a thousand more tips and I could talk all day, but I have to go. I, I would love to do a whole seminar on how to do YouTube because it's what I live every day. Um, but shoot me an email, okay? My email address is on the site and um, I'll be happy to, to help you in any way I can. Okay. Um... Yeah, and you know, Norman's got a really good point. Shutter speed is the king, set it first, and then make sure you're getting your photo sharp. I would say, Norman, though, as sort of a little add-on to that, you sometimes might want motion blur in your photos, right? But even then, you're still dealing with shutter speed first. For example, someone riding a bicycle, right? You have a lot of different ways that you can shoot someone riding a bicycle, okay? And a lot of photographers, new photographers, would start out and they'd go, oh, they're riding a photographer, they're moving. That means I gotta have a really high shutter speed. Crank it all the way up to, you know, one eight thousandth of a second. And they'll freeze the person riding the bicycle. The more experienced photographers will say, hmm, let's show them in motion. And they'll put the camera to 1 30th of a second, okay? 1 30th of a second, which is starting to get into, you know, camera shake. And they'll pan and follow the bicyclist and snap it. And that way, for more, you know, if they do it right, the bicyclist is in focus, but they have this kind of motion blur in the background and it looks really cool. If you haven't tried that, give it a shot. It's, it's a lot of fun to do those things. Love it. Okay, I, I really gotta go. Um, but yeah, that's that's all for now. Thank you all. Um, wanna make sure, any last questions? Oh, Ver okay, hello, hello to Italy. Um, Andrea, I went to the Romeo and Juliet place where everybody wrote their names, wrote their names on the wall. Oh my God, it's really cool. Really, really cool. I, I don't, is that place still there? It's like Romeo and Juliet's house or something. and. So people go there and they write, and there's just thousands of, you know, Mark loves Mary, <laughs> you know, little hearts drawn around. It's really cool. It's really cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, we got some spam coming in here. How do I get? How do I get rid of the spam? Ban. Let me ban this. Boom. All right. So. 
that's another thing I gotta say but as I as I shut this down for today I will never ask you for money I will never use telegram I will never use whatsapp okay so if you ever see a YouTube channel with my picture and it doesn't have that little check mark it's not me ignore it just flat out ignore it I deal with a lot of spam I have ways to control the spam I have software now that I got from github that goes in and automatically wipes the spam out but you know it's every time I do it more comes back and it's just a part of being on YouTube so help me as well and just you know be suspicious of that. If you ever see me, I will never email you telling you you've won anything. I don't, I just wouldn't do that. So, I, and I gotta say this because we've had members of the channel who have lost money because of these scammers. And I wanna punch them in the face. I really, I, I don't like that. I, it's a weird feeling when you know that your photo is out there on a site stealing from your audience. That's a, it's a hard pill to swallow, my friends. Hard pill to swallow. So. Help me help you and just don't respond to those people and I'll do what I can to ban them delete them report them to YouTube and it's just gonna get worse that's just how it is you know okay so we're all good thank you uh, backstage members I'll see you on discord I'll be around over the weekend the rest of you I will see you in a new video next week thank you so much for joining me uh, I gotta go back to this okay da -da 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 -da. if you uh, where is it? Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the live stream. If you did, be sure to give it the like and the subscribe. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? Um, wait, hold on. I'll get this down to a science at one point. Um, but seriously, thank you for joining me today. As always, Friday is my favorite day of the week. And you're the reason why. I love doing this. I love seeing you here. And I cannot wait to see you next week. So... Next week, 4 p.m., I'll see you on the next live stream. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week. Take care.